One of the most prevalent topics concerning culture and organizational health today is psychological safety. Whether you have a complete working knowledge of the topic or simply nod when it is mentioned, this session, I promise, is for you. You will leave with specific ideas on how you can create greater psychological safety with those around you starting immediately. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you are listening to this podcast, you could have been with us live, uh, and so you could actually do that for future episodes. Uh, you can get all of that information by connecting with us on either our Facebook or LinkedIn groups, and you can do that by going to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn, where these episodes always are live, as well as on Twitter and YouTube, et cetera. Well, anyway, today's episode is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's Success. You can learn more and get an excerpted chapter uh, by going to longdistanceteambook.com. That's longdistanceteambook.com. I hope you'll do that. And now, without further ado, I'm going to bring in my guests, and here they are. Let me introduce them for us. And we will get started. Uh, today, you are looking at or about ready to hear from Carolyn Helbig and Minette Norman. Carolyn spent 15 years with McKinsey as a top management consultant and has deep experience in neuroscience research. She helps leaders increase their effectiveness, optimize team performance, and transform their organizations through mindset, emotional intelligence, and psychological safety. Building on her three decades leading global technical teams in the software industry, Manette Norman focuses on developing transformational leaders who create inclusive working environments with the foundation of psychological safety. She has a deep commitment to fostering inclusion in the workplace and is a sought after speaker in the areas of psychological safety, inclusive cultures, radical empathy, and collaborative teams. Together, they have developed the Psychological Safety Playbook. The playbook provides 25 proven strategies to help leaders increase psychological safety on their teams and lead more powerfully by being more human. And there we have it. And there they are. And I'm glad you're both here. Welcome. Thanks for being here, both of you. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Happy to be here, Kevin. And, and so like, let's see, we've got people from with us from Brazil and Colorado and New York and we got people saying hello to you both. So we've got people here from around the world, uh, and we're, we are around the world-ish. Uh, Manette is in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Carolyn is in Germany, and I am halfway-ish between in Indianapolis. So uh, so glad. Oh, and here we go. We've got the Ukraine joining us as well. So listen, we're from everywhere. We all have this challenge around psychological safety, and so we are in the right place to have you guys join both join us. So where I want to start is how did you come to work together? Give us a little bit of the backstory of how did you end up doing this? Manette, why don't you tell us that story real quick? Okay, real quick. We both met in an online class in 2021. We were getting a certification in running psychological safety assessments based on Amy Edmondson's work. And we met and we were in the same little cohort and we hit it off. And Caroline heard me say that there was a lack of practical information about psychological safety. It sort of stopped with the research, the assessment, and then what? And so she reached out to me and she had this crazy idea. That was the subject of her email. And she said, what if you and I collaborated and developed something together? And we initially thought it would just be for our clients, a free download. And it turned into something more and it became the book that you just held up, the Psychological Safety Playbook. So that was 2021 when we met and it's almost two years since that meeting and we have never met face-to-face, -face, only on Zoom. There you go. I have also written, well, I've, I've never written a book with someone I've never met face-to-face, -face, but I've certainly written books uh, completely at a distance. So I know what that is like as well. So, um, so Caroline, tell us, the, I mean, I opened by saying, hey, we're going to talk about psychological safety. And it, it's something, it's all over the, the media. People are talking about it. And it's one of those phrases that I think everyone's heard. And maybe not everyone even really even understands it. So why don't we 
just start there. Can you give us a bit of a definition just so we're all on a level playing field? Yeah, sure. And we experience this too. Um, now, psychological safety is really a term which is a, around a lot in, in companies. And a lot of leaders kind of uh, go, this again, it's really touchy-feely. You know, I really have to do tough business and numbers and so on. I don't have time for any kind of nice to have. And this is really something we want to um, put in perspective because psychological safety is not a nice to have. It's foundation if you want to have and create high performing teams. So psychological safety might sound like an academic term. However, it's really a deep human experience we all know every one of us all the listeners know how it feels if you're part of a team where you feel invited to really um, be authentic bring your whole self um, come up with any ideas wild ideas crazy ideas whatever it is maybe challenge the status quo um where you in, are invited also to disagree yeah to or if you're um, in contrast part of a team where you fear to speak up, where you fear to challenge the maybe um, what everyone else agrees to, where you think twice and, um, and, and, and even more times about, can I say this? Or how is it perceived? And maybe um, it's a risk I can't take because of serious risk. I just recently had a discussion that um, there are certain career limiting moves. So you can't say anything. You can't be open. You have to think twice. You have to have the scissor in your brain to really cut out what, what maybe is too risky to do. And that's exactly the point. And this atmosphere where everyone can really share openly is not, not something which um, which is is our natural default. It's not something which um, um, is in place automatically. It's really something which a team, a leader, really needs to cultivate very deliberately because there are many things going against it. So it's crucial. It's not automatically happening and it's something which we all can create with little things we can do every day in every interaction and it's that point that brought the book to us right like what are specific yes. things that we can do and so it is called a playbook uh in fact i never even used just the word book in the introduction i just used the word playbook because i i get the sense that's what you want to call it uh and that's sort of the model for the book so manette the outline of the book is there are five sort of buckets. Um, my, my word now, not yours. There's sort of five big areas and then five plays that we can run to use that metaphor inside of each of those five areas. So uh, what are the five big plays, five buckets, five, what, five, whatever you want to call it, five areas? Um, just real quickly, just tell us what those five are. Then I just want us to get real practical and have a conversation about some of the specifics. Okay. So Manette, give us the Give us those five things real quick, and I'll put, put them up on the screen as you talk about them. Happy to do that. So, yeah, we call them plays. You can think of them as chapters or buckets, whatever you like. But See, I didn't one. want to use chapter because <laughs> it's, it's okay. a playbook, everybody, not a book. So It's ahead. okay. It's okay. It's what people know, and we did really want it to be like individual plays that you can pick out and use one at a time, one by one. So we have five plays, and under each five plays is our five moves. And those individual moves are the actions that you can put into practice. So let me just start with the outline of the plays. The first play is called Communicate Courageously. The second is Master the Art of Listening. Play three is Manage Your Reactions. Play four is Embrace Risk and Failure. And plays, play five, Design Inclusive Rituals. So that gives us the play overview. There Happy to there's, go wherever you like after. Yeah, that. there's a play overview. And, and I think that people that have maybe a cursory or initial thought about psychological safety would say, oh, yeah, it's about 
it's about embracing risk and failure and making it okay for people to have made a mistake and to share that they made a mistake. And that's certainly one of the five, but it's not the whole, the whole thing. Um, what I really thought we would do is just have fun with some of the moves. I'll ask you some other questions after that. But what I'd like to do is ask each of you, I, I know these are like your 20, these moves are like your children. I understand that, but I'm going to ask you to pick a favorite, each of you. So, so Carolyn of the 25 moves within the five plays, What's one of them that's a favorite of yours? And you can pick favorite you know, however you want to pick it. What's one I, of your favorites? Actually, I have 25 favorites now. Yeah, I know, but we don't have time <laughs> for 25. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I really like very much the very first move we share in the book, which is very small, simple, and can have a big effect. Just last week, I had a discussion here in Germany with um, someone from HR, big company in automotive, and he was just blown away because he shared this little move with a pilot team. They used it, and they changed completely the nature of their meetings. And that, um, so let me and that move is, no, now you're just teasing us. Now you've got to tell us what the move is. Yeah, the move, the move is a simple question, a simple question with um, rooted in a deep attitude. Um, the question is, what am I missing? And if you as a leader ask this powerful question, honestly, I've never heard, witnessed, had a manager asking this question. It's so powerful because what does it What's the effect of this question? The effect is that people really feel invited to contribute. Plus, you as a leader convey that you are humble enough to realize what you see is not the truth, it's not the whole picture. You need others to contribute and come to the whole picture. So there is a lot behind this question. It's not just a rhetorical trick or something. It's really right. rooted in a deep attitude of humility and openness and curiosity. I'm, I'm looking. The reason I looked over here wasn't that I was ignoring any of you. Those of you who haven't been watching knows that Kevin looked over here. It's because on the whiteboard over here, I have a list I was counting. I have seven. I think it's seven. Um, four word questions. Uh, I, I'm a collector of questions anyway, but I happen to love four word questions. And this, I was making sure if it was on the list or not. It's not. It's going to get added to the list. What am I missing? Four words. Uh, so I love that. And I love the two things that you said about it. Both it requires us to be humble, but it mm -hmm. also shows that we are humble, mm -hmm. right? Uh, pretty much all questions help us show being curious, being curious, but the humility piece, I think, especially as a leader is super important. So Manette, it's your turn. A favorite other than what am I missing? Well, I'm going to change my favorite from yesterday. We were on a different podcast yesterday and I said my favorite was X, but I have a new favorite today. It's the <laughs> mood that I'm in. <laughs> my favorite today is upgrade meetings. It's under design inclusive rituals. And why it's so important is that we spend so much of our time in the workplace in meetings and meetings often are really a reflection of our culture. And when you think about the meetings that you sit in, think about who dominates the airtime, who speaks, who gets listened to, who stays silent. All of these are really your culture playing out. And the way you can change that and interrupt the maybe unhealthy and not very inclusive patterns in your culture is to change the way you run meetings. And so we have this concept that we share in, in play five, move one, which is to appoint an inclusion booster. And what that really is, is someone to, I like that you, you like that, Kevin. It's, a, it's basically having someone facilitate your meetings to look out for everyone and make sure everyone is fully included and respected and heard. And it's important because, first of all, we don't usually do that. I mean, sometimes we bring in an outside facilitator for a big meeting. But for everyday meetings, like a staff meeting, you can just appoint one person to be the inclusion booster for the day and to make sure everyone gets to speak, no one gets interrupted, no one's dominating, and that you're mining for 
dissent and having people not just converge and have groupthink, but instead really like, where's an opposing viewpoint? Who's going to be devil's advocate? And all of these things, it's really important that you rotate that role of the inclusion booster so everyone gets a sense of what is it like to facilitate? What are the team dynamics that we may not even be aware of? And how might we do better so everyone feels they are heard, they're valued, they can fully participate. And there, there's lots more ideas we have, including in the virtual world, making use of all the tools that we have in front of us to be even more inclusive, like using online whiteboarding and chat that often bring in the quieter voices and the ideas that wouldn't normally be heard. So Carlene and I both really agree that Upgrading meetings is so critical to creating a, a psychologically safe culture. And so today, that's my favorite of our moves. Your comment about meetings being a reflection of our culture, I think, is, is completely accurate. In fact, I would say if you want to get a sense of an organizational culture, like like the two of you, I find myself inside of organizations on a regular basis. And uh, I, I learn more about the culture by walking into a meeting than I do by reading mm -hmm. anything they send me ahead of time. I promise you that because that's what's really happening, what's really going on. And, and culture is the way we do things here, which means it's the process, right? And when we think about a meeting, we often think about what we're trying to accomplish, but the process, Manette, what you're talking about with the, the inclusion booster, having someone facilitate to make easier, right? What to facilitate yes. means um, is, is a really powerful thing. So now I'm gonna share, I don't know if it's my favorite, but uh, one that I think is really practical. It happens to follow. I, it might even be move two in the fifth one. It's either move two or move three. It's right after inclusion booster. It's about taking turns. And, and the reason I, I want one of you, and I'll let you, I, I, I'm going to make one of you pick uh, which one of you wants to take this one. Um, but the reason I picked this one is that it, it shows everyone that the stuff in the book is very practical. And it shows everyone, whether you read the book or not, that there are little things that we can do that can make a big difference in starting to create a new or a renewed sense of psychological safety. So the idea is in a meeting, it's called take turns. Tell me about take turns. Yeah, and the subtitle on that one that is actually a rule that you can try out that we call no one speaks twice until everyone speaks once. And it wasn't something we made up, we found it somewhere. Carlene, do you wanna talk about it or do you want me to? Go ahead, Minette. I know that um, your heart is with um, the inclusion play. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. So what, what we really see, honestly, and I, there's actually a lot of data about this, that in most meetings, if you have 10 people in a meeting, two people do all the talking and eight people stay silent. That's a common pattern that plays out a lot. And so what you really want to do, if you want to create an inclusive and psychologically safe culture is that you have to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak, that they're listened to, and that their voice is welcome. And so one way to just do that practically is say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try this out because we haven't done it before. We're going to try this rule. We're going to go around the virtual table. No one speaks twice until everyone speaks once. And we're going to time it because, again, we don't want anyone to dominate the airtime. So maybe you have one minute each and we do a lightning round and we go, Kevin, here's your minute. Go. And then when you're finished, I'm the inclusion booster. I say, thanks so much, Kevin. Colleen, you're next. Here's your minute. Go. And we do it that way. And it becomes the norm. You don't have to do it in every single meeting. But what it does is it gives everyone the floor. And you know, sometimes someone might not be prepared. And so that's why we actually believe there should be work before the meeting. So if you're going to be talking about a specific to topic, let people know, send them the agenda, say, here's a pre-read perhaps, or be prepared to bring your thoughts about our quarterly goals. What are your fears? What are your hopes? And be prepared to talk so that when we get to the everyone speaks once, lightning round, people who need more time to process information or to think quietly by themselves, they will be prepared to speak because it can be uncomfortable to put people on the spot if, they, if they're not fast thinkers. And not being a fast thinker doesn't mean you're smart. It just means that your brain processes differently. So we want to be as inclusive in advance of the meeting as we can. And then, of course, in the meeting. So that's the idea of turn taking that we share. Yeah, so... May I add, Kevin, one, one, one thought? Um, one um, um, tool is especially productive, I think, and I experienced this as a um, leadership consultant in many organizations, and that is what Minette just described, the time box speaking. So people can better listen if they 
are assured that their minute will come. Yeah? They, they will be allowed to speak uninterrupted. And now I can relax and allow really to, to listen fully because they know their turn will come. One, and I, I only have to listen to you for one minute. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to have to listen to you for 16 and a half minutes, uh, not, let alone the fact that I might not get a chance. So we had someone um, that's with us um, uh, ask this question. It's, it's almost the opposite of this. And you sort of answered this in a way already. It says, sometimes it's really quiet in the meeting. Do you have a favorite move to get people to speak up? I certainly have thoughts here. But uh, Manette, do you have anything? Uh, excuse me, uh, Caroline, how about you? What would you add to this? What's a favorite move you had to get people to speak? To get people to speak, yeah. And I mean, certainly there, I can imagine there are maybe different reasons why people stay quiet. So some people, it's just their personality or that general tendency. They are not so comfortable with um, speaking up, especially if maybe the meeting is broader and maybe people from higher up are present and they really kind of, yeah, I don't know a simple trick or a simple, um, there's no, 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 there's probably no simple trick to invite all of them to really speak up. Um, there might also be different reasons. So I would really, um, Give the, give the situation a little bit more thought and think about how could I tackle this? And one um, approach could really be to, um, as Minette um, mentioned, to really share a healthy agenda and what the meeting is, is going to be about so that people can, can, be, can prepare a little bit more. Because I know people who feel on the spot they can't, can't uh, reply and they hate to be kind of on the heat seat and um, reply immediately. So give people a chance to come prepared and then probably um, you already experience uh, meetings which are less quiet. Um, for those um, people who, I don't know, um, for whatever reason in their personality or in the setting, prefer to be um, quite I also think it's part of the um, creating psychological safety that you don't press people to do something they feel uncomfortable with. It's more about inviting. And uh, what often um, is very powerful if, um, for example, leaders do courageous acts in terms of um, showing the vulnerability, showing their humanity to others, because then people feel, oh, it's okay to show up as a human being and not be perfect in what you share, in what you say, and so on. So sharing vulnerability, that's um, something where it's a great idea that the leader goes first. However, when sharing an idea, um, it's often a good idea for leaders to go last yes. because otherwise what you will experience everyone agrees to the to the leader and you have groupthink in the room yeah you know if if we do a couple of the things that you that that you have both talked about you really help with that question right so uh giving people the sense of what's coming and being so they can come better prepared is certainly one of those things if you have if you continue to have meetings where no one wants to share anything you might really need this book because the reasons they may not be sharing might be because that they don't feel safe to share, right? Uh, as you said, Caroline, there's many reasons why people may not share, but but not feeling safe to share or not feeling like they're, they're it matters if they share are some of the big ones for sure. Um, so you hinted at this, Manette, when you talked about the fact that we might, might be having a meeting virtually, right? Uh, but I'm curious, I mean, You've written this, you wrote this book fundamentally uh, during the pandemic, right? Uh, but you both have been thinking about and working with and, and helping organizations with psychological safety since the before times, uh, if you will. So my question is, what's different now? Or, or what's, what, I'll just call it like I often call it. What's the long distance difference? Like, what do we need to know, Manette? about doing this if our team is hybrid, if our team is completely remote or whatever, like what should we know about 
psychological safety that maybe takes an even greater importance when our team isn't always in the same place? Yeah, it's a, it's an it's certainly an important question and top of mind for most organizations. And in some ways, I would say that fully virtual is easier than hybrid. And I'm gonna I'll explain my thinking here. <laughs> hybrid hybrid is interesting because hybrid actually existed in the before times. When I was in tech, we had people who were in one office, we had people all over the world, and we had people who worked from home. And what I remember about that experience is that people who were in an office together had a better experience than those who were remote. They, the people who were remote didn't get the same conversations, the coffee conversations, the team building things that we would do in the office. And they felt like they were almost a second class. They were like less than than the people who were in the office. They just didn't get those casual conversations and even maybe a, a decision that was made in a hallway because you ran into someone and you quickly solved a problem. When you're all virtual, you have to be very deliberate about how do we interact? How do we socialize? How do we do meetings? How do we get work done? How do we collaborate? All of those things have to be fairly explicitly spelled out when you're working virtually. So now that teams are much more frequently hybrid in that some are virtual and some have come back to the office, I think we have to be equally deliberate to make sure that we're not creating a different experience for those who are face-to-face -face and can have those coffee conversations and hallway conversations and those who are fully virtual and instead be deliberate about how do we communicate? How do we socialize when some of us are face-to-face -face and some aren't? How do we have hard discussions? How do we have fun? And although that sounds you know, contrived, how do we have fun? You probably have to figure that out. How can we have fun? You definitely it's, have to figure that it's out. It's an important yeah. part of work, right? It's a, and in fact, in our book, we, we talk about laughter and levity as a really important part. They play an important role in building psychological safety when we can joke, when we can tease, when we can laugh together. So how do we have time for that? when we're virtual. So, so what I think every leader needs to be thinking about now is really how can we have a great, inclusive, psychologically safe environment, team environment, no matter where we are and no matter who's where, and that we don't create a sort of second, you know, a first tier and second tier mm -hmm. environment for people, but that everyone is having an equally and equitable experience. So that, those are my thoughts about it. Be, beware proximity bias, everyone. Yes. Call it. And, and, and here's the thing, here's the other interesting piece, and we don't have time to go into this any further, but I'll, I'll toss this out for everyone. And that is that while Manette, you described exactly the way it was uh, before, now there are many cases where the people who, who, who get to stay home uh, actually, the people in the office feel sometimes, not everyone, some of those people are like, well, I wish I could be one of the people that's not doesn't have to commute. So there's this whole other set of yes. dynamics on top of everything you said is still true. And there may be some other things going on too. Like we just have to be extremely intentional, especially as a leader in that setting uh, to make sure that we're taking care of all that. So I've got some so the final questions I like to always ask and people that have listened to the podcast before know I'm going to ask, but, but one more before we, before we get to that last segment, Caroline, I'm really curious about this. So, you know, the world has changed in the last three years and there's, there's been more discussion about psychological safety. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a pandemic uh, and there's a lot more discussion about mental health and mm -hmm. or mental fitness is what I would like to call it. Uh, my question is this, has the bar on psychological safety changed? In other words, like we knew this was a thing that was something we ought to be thinking about before, but is the bar, is the expectation different? Like what's different now than what it was three, four years ago? Ah, interesting um, to think about and probably my answer is a little bit biased sitting in Germany doing work with clients, uh, international companies, however, who are sitting here. So what I'm sharing probably isn't applying to, to all over the world. What I see is that <clears throat> companies more and more realize the importance of psychological safety. And um, Amy Edmondson once said that no company who wants to be successful <clears throat> in the future can afford to not care about psychological safety. And my feeling is that the pandemic kind of accelerated 
bringing psychological safety on the radar of companies. And what I see is that they really um, do yeah, go into effort to really make psychological safety work in their organizations. So I'm really quite optimistic. And um, actually, I, 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 um, a couple of, of weeks ago, I um, came across someone who said psychological safety now really became a buzzword. And that was really bothering me. And my experience is that this is not the case, that the pandemic and the crisis um, really accelerated bringing psycho psychological safety really on the strategic agenda of companies. And I'm, I'm pleased about that. And I see how, how, um, how important it is for companies. They reach out and they want to discuss and they really think about how can they really make a difference and an impact. So in terms of and, and mental well-being, mental fitness is really a big part. Well-being, um, quiet quitting, all these things really play a role. Uh, be careful what we ask for, right? I mean, we, we want people to be more interested in and, and be more aware of psychological safety. And then it may become a buzzword. Uh, but we've got to be careful what we ask for. So I'm going to shift gears now before we finish, uh, Manette. I'm going to, I'm asking us both of you this question, okay. uh, but Manette, here's the question. What do you do for fun? What do you do for fun? I mean, besides be on my podcast, of course. Yes. Well, there's this. Yes. And I write books with Colleen, but no, what I do for fun, fun, when I'm away from my computer and I'm away from the desk, I am a big hiker. I live in a really beautiful place with beautiful hiking trails. So I'm out on the trails a lot. Mm -hmm. I am also an avid reader and I am a knitter. So I, I'm constantly knitting things. And I find that is really fun. And, you know, I have something tangible at the end, which is often not the case when you're doing cerebral yeah, work. The work. So I like to, do. There is I like to have something I can, right? yeah, I like to have something I can give as a gift. And so that's fun for me too. Perfect. Caroline, same question. What do you do for fun? What I am I doing for fun? Um, I love reading. Um, that might sound a little bit boring, but I really um, get so much out of books. Um, and I like cooking. Um, and that's um, one of the positive aspects of having a big family, that um, you have constantly to cook and really produce a lot of, a lot of um, stuff. And I really <clears throat> love when I have the time to experiment. So I'm a big fan of Otto Lenghi and the spicy recipes and um, love to experiment. And I'm really grateful for my family because they are, they are interested in, um, in those experiments. So they are punishing me for trying new things. This is something I really, really enjoy. And what I really love is um, uh, walking by the sea so we are unfortunately in the middle of germany however whenever i can do so i travel to um the northern sea and i just love the coast there beautiful so i'll be there on tuesday for dinner uh so uh you both the only question and i'm going to sneeze <coughs> excuse me Bless you. the only question you both knew i was going to ask was the, is the next one which is what are you reading so carolyn what yeah, are you reading uh, you you have it in front of you. I know you showed you showed me earlier. I'm, I'm reading this fantastic book, Indestructible, by Neil Eyal. Um, I love this book. Um, really, really, um, uh, great stuff. How to control your attention and choose your life. And what I love especially is it's so easy for us to blame external things like technology, our iPhones, our mails, whatever for us being distracted. But the tricky thing and the real root cause is internal triggers. And we kind of choose to get distracted, right? It's no one there forcing us to open the iPhone. It's us choosing to do so. And I love what he's sharing about mastering internal triggers to really master and, and focus your attention. I Love it. And it's a great book, everybody. We'll have that in the yeah. show notes for you. Manette, your turn. What are you reading? Yeah, or listening I was, to? 
I think for I Matt. listen. Yeah, I mostly read now via audiobooks because I'm super auditory and I really love to listen to books. So the the most my most recent listen was a book by a fellow Page Two author. So Page Two is the publisher for the Psychological Safety Playbook. And through them, I was introduced to this other author who just released her book, which is called Rising. It's a memoir. It's called Rising from a Mud Hut to the Boardroom and Back Again. And it's by Gracie Harkema. And Gracie was born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And she was adopted when she was a baby by Americans and moved to the US. And it's her story of, of her, I mean, an incredible life. She was almost left to die. She was premature and very ill and then was taken in. And she's now a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant in the U.S. And it's a pretty extraordinary story. So I was, I was very mesmerized by her story. And she reads it in her own voice. So that was great. Rising. We'll have that in the show notes as well. And now the question that you both have wanted me to really to ask from the very beginning, which is how can we learn more about what you're up to? Uh, where do you, where do you want to point us and where can we get a copy of this great book, the psychological safety playbook? Where do you want to point us? Well, I will, or we will, I'm going to speak on behalf of both of us. I will point you to our website, the psychological safety playbook.com. There's there are links to get the book from there. Although you can get it at all the online retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, et cetera, Porchlight. But on the website, besides the links to the book, we also have some sample materials that you can download. There's some really helpful things, like there's a one sheet called 25 Moves at a Glance that gives you an overview of our 25 moves. We're constantly developing new materials that will be on the website. So go there and sign up for our, for our downloads. And then we are also really active on LinkedIn, both of us. And we love to hear from people. We love to connect with people. We want to hear what's working for you from the playbook and from your other ideas and what you're struggling with because Caroline and I have just gotten started in some ways working together. We've written this book, but it is not the end of our collaboration. So we want to keep adding value. What do you need help with? So, so please get in touch with us. LinkedIn or the psychological safety playbook.com. Uh, so thank you both for being here. We're not quite finished, but I've got a question now for everybody else. I'm done asking questions of our guests. And now I want to ask you the question I ask you every single week. Now what? What action are you going to take as a result of this? Like you've got some very specific moves that you could make in your meetings. We talked about a variety of things in your meetings, as well as a very powerful question that you could ask. Maybe your next step is to ask that question. What am I missing of someone else on your team or maybe even of yourself uh, in the next 24 hours. Make it your challenge to do that in the next little bit. Make sure that you think about how you might use one of the other tools that we talked about. Maybe it's something I didn't mention, but it's the thing that made sense to you or would make a difference for you. Because at the end of the day, if you don't take action on what you've learned here, it wasn't a real great use of your time. Listen, we hope that you did. You hope you do that. And I hope that you all come back. But before I say that, to both of you, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. I've been looking forward to having this conversation. And I'm so glad that we were able to do it. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. It was great to talk with you. It was my pleasure. And every week, it's my pleasure to have other brilliant and wise guests to join us. So if you loved this, you need to come back. And if you have watched or listened before, wherever you're watching or listening, make sure you like and subscribe and you know what to do. Send it to someone else, invite someone else to join you next time for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We'll see you all soon.